This video will explain momentum contrastive learning from researchers at Facebook AI. Contrastive learning is about forming representations that help distinguish one object from another, such as being able to distinguish a lion from a bottle of water. Momentum contrast views this problem as a dictionary problem to match a query with its positive key encoding and make it as dissimilar as possible to the negative key encodings. An end-to-end -end approach would use a neural network to encode the query and a neural network to encode the keys and then take the gradient through each the query encoding network and the key encoding network. This is highly memory inefficient and MoCo shows that you only need to pass the gradients through the query encoder. The key encoder is updated by adding a momentum update of the query encoder's parameters. Images are mapped into low dimensional key representations and kept in a queue for sampling for contrastive loss comparisons. This last in first out queue puts the most recently encoded batch of data on top of the queue popping out old key encodings. This enables large dictionaries with consistent key encodings with the changing parameters of the query and key neural networks as they evolve during training. The first edition of Momentum Contrast briefly held the trophy for unsupervised representation learning and computer vision before SimCLR from researchers at Google came along and took the crown. However, MoCo v2 shows that a lot of the ideas in SimCLR are orthogonal to the MoCo framework and can be integrated to achieve superior results to either framework on their own. Momentum contrast has also recently been used in CURL from researchers at UC Berkeley to achieve successful control on the DeepMind control suite with only pixel inputs and no physical state inputs such as the angular velocity on different sensors of the robot. If you're interested in the CURL paper from Berkeley, Please subscribe and stay tuned to Machine Learning Street Talk, where Yannick Kilcher, Tim Scarf, and I will host Aravind Trinivas to talk about the paper. This video will explain momentum contrastive learning from Facebook AI. This video will explain momentum contrast for self-supervised learning from Facebook AI. MoCo2 with extensions from Google's SimCLR framework is the current state of the art in unsupervised representation learning from images achieving 71.2% ImageNet accuracy with a ResNet 50. This is narrowing the gap between supervised and unsupervised learning and computer vision and powering reinforcing learning control on the DeepMind control suite from only pixel inputs and no physical state inputs in CURL from researchers at UC Berkeley. The idea behind contrastive learning is that we just need representations of high dimensional data that allows us to distinguish one instance from another instance, a dollar bill from an umbrella or a dollar bill from a tiger. So the motivation here in comparing it with things like pixel-based reconstruction methods like the big BIGAN framework is that we don't have these mental models that allow us to completely reconstruct objects from memory. The difference between drawing a dollar bill from memory and then drawing a dollar bill when you have one right in front of you shows that we have these different kinds of representations of objects that just allow us to distinguish it from one another rather than being able to completely reproduce these objects. We're interested in self-supervised learning because it's much easier to collect unlabeled data than it is to collect labeled data. In the case of natural language processing, this has been enormously successful by scraping these massive text data sets from the internet, consisting of articles and all this miscellaneous kind of text data that's on the internet, and then using it to do self-supervised learning, where you automatically construct a supervised learning task to predict a masked out token, and then you use the representations of the tokens that the uh, deep neural network learns as in the GBT or the BERT model, and then you fine tune these representations onto downstream tasks like question answering, uh, natural language inference, summarization, named entity recognition, and all the different natural language processing tasks. In computer vision, we wanna have a similar pipeline where we have these massive image data sets, and then we're just fine tuning them on things like pose recognition, object detection, segmentation, or classification. The closest we've come so far is the SimCLR 4X framework. SimCLR introduced a lot of interesting advancements to the contrastive self-supervised learning framework that made it a lot stronger, particularly showing the benefits of larger batch sizes, larger models, uh, stronger data augmentation, and then adding a multi-layer perceptron projection head from the representations to the classification layer between the contrastive loss function. So you see that the SimCLR 4X model surpasses the supervised learning uh, baseline on the ResNet 50 model, whereas the SimCLR is the 4X width multiplier. In this paper, we're gonna see MoCo V2 go to about 71% accuracy, but on the same fair ResNet 50 model, so it isn't kind of biased by being a deeper neural network, or not deeper, but a wider, you know, more parameter model that would bias the uh, results comparing supervised learning to unsupervised learning. Contrastive self-supervised learning has been successfully used as an auxiliary task for mapping from the high dimensional pixel input 
into low dimensional representations that can be used in things like mapping from state to action and reinforcement learning and doing the value estimate from a given state has been more successful by using the contrastive self-supervised learning framework in momentum contrast to get better representations of these high dimensional pixel inputs. They're able to achieve this control suite uh, task in the curl paper from researchers at UC Berkeley with only the pixel inputs compared to the physical state input, such as in the bipedal walking task on OpenAI Gym, how you have like the angular velocity and these different things like the acceleration on the different uh, hip and knee joints on the bipedal walking agent that makes the control task easier. So imagine being able to build these robots where all you need is a camera to sense the input state compared to having to build these little uh, sensors all over the arms of the robot, these miscellaneous things to give it physical state information. So this is done by using contrastive learning to map these augmented views of the same state and make them more similar to each other in the representation than previously seen states as the reinforcement learning agent is interacting with its environment and taking in these pixel inputs. In this slide, we'll do a quick overview of the momentum contrast of algorithm, and then throughout the rest of the presentation, we'll break down each piece of it and go through it in more detail. So the high level idea of contrastive learning is that we want to make the query similar to its positive key and dissimilar to the negative keys. So we do this by doing the softmax loss function between the query and then the positive key representation, and then summing that over the query similarity with all the other keys in the queue. So one way of doing contrastive learning would be to have an end-to-end -end encoder of the query and encoder of the keys. So the problem with this though, is that we'd be putting the gradient through the query encoder and the key encoder. So if we take these uh, high dimensional images and then encode them and then have these uh, keys that have been encoded and then use that in this loss function, then we're gonna be taking gradients in the key encoder and the query encoder. So momentum contrast shows that you don't need to do this. All you need to do is take the gradients from the query encoder and then update the parameters of the key encoder by doing this uh, momentum update where, where you take the uh, previous weights from the encoder and then you add them with the new weights from the query encoder after it you know, takes a step with the gradient from this loss function and then you use that to update the key encoder as well. So it's kind of interesting having this different uh, encoder, the query encoder, then the key encoder and the key encoder is progressively slowly evolving with the momentum update to taking the parameters from the query encoder as is being updated in this loss function. So by doing this, the uh, momentum contrast algorithm is much more memory efficient than other end-to-end -end, uh, learning algorithms. And it's also much more efficient than say, having just a memory bank of previously encoded keys because those representations get really outdated because this is a dynamically moving uh, dictionary. The, the key representations and the query representations are changing as you're training this neural network. So another interesting detail of this is the queue. And the queue is basically saying, as you sample a mini batch, it's this last in first out data structure where the newly sampled uh, mini batch uh, goes into the front of the queue and then is you know, gonna be sampled more so. And then the last, the oldest keys are popped out of the queue and are no longer used for training the uh, momentum contrastive learning algorithm. The key way of thinking about the momentum contrast algorithm is to think of contrastive learning as a dynamic dictionary lookup problem where you have this dictionary of the positive and negative keys and is changing over time as you're training the parameters of the query and key encoders. So the contrast of losses can be thought of as building dynamic dictionary representations of the keys and the queries. The keys are sampled from the data and are represented by that encoder that's updated by taking the query parameters and blending them in with the previous steps encoder parameters of the keys. It's similar to its matching key and dissimilar to others by taking this loss function of matching the similarity between the positive key and then dividing that by the similarity with all the other keys in the data set. The positive keys are formed by doing data augmentation on the current query to form its matching key positive key. So in the SimCLR framework, they experiment with really strong data augmentations to form the positive keys. And they're also doing this framework of having the query and the key both be augmented versions of the original image. So some examples of these augmentations are things like rotations, but what's most commonly used in these frameworks, such as SimCLR and Momentum Contrast, is to crop the image to get a different view of it. So say you have a 256 by 256 image, you would take different 224 by 224 crops of that same image to form the positive pair. The extensions in the Momentum Contrast of Learning Framework are based on the idea that these key dictionaries should be large, such that they can better sample the underlying continuous high dimensional visual space. In metric learning, we have a lot of papers that are looking at sort of like hard negative mining, trying to find the best negative keys to compare with the positive key in this kind of similar, dissimilar, uh, contrastive loss function. So the idea of that is that if you have a large key dictionary, you'll be able to just kind of average out this idea of having like a hard sample mining and a large enough uh, dictionary 
will allow that uh, function to just naturally kind of separate the uh, positive and negative query, key, query keys and queries without having to do such a deliberate search for the negative keys. The next idea is that they should be consistent as they evolve during training. So let's say you do one approach where you have a memory bank where you use the previous encoder parameters, say theta k at like t minus five or whatever, and you use that to encode the high dimensional images and then you just leave that in a data set and you sample from that to do the uh, loss function. But that idea is that the representations of those keys are gonna be outdated. You want the encoding of the keys to be evolving with the query as they're doing the training. So this idea is that you, know, you want the momentum update to be updating the encoder such that it is having a more updated representation of the keys to make this learning more meaningful. We wanna have a large dictionary such that we have a more stable bottom term with comparing the similarity between the query and the negative keys. But one problem with doing these previous end-to-end -end methods is that if you're gonna take these gradients where you take the raw high dimensional image and then pass it through a key encoder as well as doing the same thing for the query encoder and then put the gradients back through the key encoder as well, you're gonna quickly run out of memory for doing that. Compared to not only just uh, not taking the gradients back through the key encoder, which obviously saves you time, you're also able to just store these low dimensional representations rather than having to keep the high dimensional images and then repeatedly pass them through this key encoder. So they also know that the largest mini batch, this pretty massive machine of eight Volta 32 gigabyte GPUs can afford is 1024. So you can't scale up to these ma massive batch sizes that the SimCLR paper shows that self-supervised learning really benefits from. These are some of the solutions in momentum contrast to maintain a key dictionary that's large and consistent with respect to the updating query encoder and the new key encoder. So the first idea is to only use query gradients to update the representation. We've seen how you're only taking the gradients with respect to the query neural network and not constantly updating the key encoder as well. You update the key in network with a momentum update where you're taking the parameters of the key network and then you're weighting them with the previous step of the key parameters with a new step of the query neural network parameters that have just been updated by taking the gradients with respect to that loss function. So another interesting detail of this that they show in their ablation is that the momentum parameter is pretty large. It's between uh, 0 0.99 and 0 0.99999. So what that means is you're really very slowly changing the key encoder parameters. You see if M is 0 0.99999, it's basically gonna be the same exact network with these very small changes from the query network parameters. So the next idea is to maintain a queue this is how you have these consistent keys and you don't have these previously encoded keys that came from like, you know, the key parameters that say like 20 steps ago that are really outdated. You maintain this queue, this last in first out data structure where you sample this new batch of images and then you pop and then you encode them. And then you pop those encodings into the queue, popping out the, uh, you know, the oldest encoded representations from a way older set of these key parameters. There's another interesting connection between these momentum updated consistent key encodings and things like double queue learning. So in queue learning, we update the networks with this thing called a TD error, where you're basically taking a step in the environment and then you're saying, what was the reward I actually experienced compared to what, and then added to what I predict I'll get in the future compared to what I had predicted at the previous before I took that step. So the idea is you don't wanna compare the neural network to itself, it can be instable. So this idea of having the slowly progressive key encoder sort of present, prevents this problem of estimation bias where you're comparing the neural network with its exact same copy of itself, which can cause these kind of instability problems. Back to the motivation of using contrastive self-supervised learning to form representations of high dimensional images for computer vision tasks on these massive unlabeled data sets. The authors experiment with ImageNet with 1 million images where you have mini batch sizes of 256 and 8 GPUs that takes 53 hours to train on a ResNet 50. Then they use this more illustrative case of these real world unlabeled massive data sets, the 1 billion images from Instagram. I think in their latest paper, the semi-weekly super semi-supervised learning, some paper like that, they use about 3.5 billion of these images. So in this case, they're doing mini batches of 1,024 in 64 GPUs, and they do this for six days of training at ResNet 50 to get this um, you know, more sort of you know, promising avenue of research, which is finding these massive unlabeled data sets to form representations for images. The first ablation study is comparing the end-to-end -end contrastive loss framework, where we take the images and then encode them with an encoder network, and then put the gradient back through the key encoder, as well as the gradient encoder, which we've discussed has these massive memory problems. The second idea would be to have a memory bank. In the memory bank, we would just encode the uh, data points and then just have this memory bank of the low dimensional representations and sample some subset of these previously encoded uh, keys and then use that for the contrastive learning function. 
loss function. But what we talked about as well with momentum contrast is that these keys are gonna be outdated. They're not evolving with the network as well. And so they're gonna be these really outdated keys. They're gonna throw off the learning of this loss function and you know make it do it. So it's comparing this query with this key that has this odd representation with respect to the current network parameters and its current understanding of the data as it's learning this dynamic dictionary that's evolving throughout the training. And then we have the momentum contrasted learning framework that gets away from the problem of end-to-end -end learning by having this kind of form of memory bank, but it's this queue that is, you know, pre, uh, putting more priority on the most recently encoded keys, and then it's also updating the parameters of the encoder with the query encoder in the momentum update. These are the results of comparing the end-to-end -end learning framework, the memory bank, and then momentum contrast of learning. The momentum contrast of learning significantly outperforms the memory bank by having the updated, more consistent key representations that are maintained in that queue. And then it outperforms the end-to-end -end learning framework because the end-to-end -end learning framework quickly runs out of memory. You can't run a 4,096 batch size with the end-to-end uh, -end learning framework. And it's also worth noting that they're using eight Volta 32 gigabyte GPUs. So if you can't do that with that kind of computing setup, you know most people won't be able to do that at all. Following the introduction of the momentum contrast of learning framework came SimCLR. The authors of this paper, Moco V2, show that a lot of the extensions in the SimCLR framework can be added on to momentum contrast of learning to further improve the framework up to 71.1% uh, ImageNet accuracy when you're using this ResNet 50 without the width multiplier. So the ideas behind SimCLR that are used in momentum contrast is first to use larger batches, which are even easier to use in momentum contrast because as we discussed, you don't have this end-to-end -end learning paradigm. Then the second idea is to use this MLP multilayer perceptron projection head as you go from this representation into the space that's used for the contrastive learning function. So you don't do the uh, query key comparison in this representation space that you're then gonna take apart and go fine tune for something like image net classification, pose detection, object detection, semantic segmentation, you know, all these different computer vision tasks. To make that same analogy with the NLP pipeline, we wanna have these representations and then fine tune them on our given task, but we wanna learn the representations from these massive unlabeled data sets. The next idea from SimCLR that they show works well in MoCo V2 is to do stronger data augmentation. Rather than just color jittering and uh, like taking these crops of the data set, they're gonna use these stronger data augmentations, these different ways of doing geometric color uh, transformations to the image data to make the different uh, same views of the same data set with respect to the query and then its positive key. In this table, you can see the performance gains achieved by adding in these different factors from the SimCLR framework. The multi-layer perceptron projection head from representation to the query key loss space, the stronger data augmentations, and then the cosine learning rate with respect to training these neural networks, and then for training them for longer epochs. And then you see the comparison with supervised learning on the same ResNet 50 model architecture. These results further show the result of scaling it up to longer epochs and then comparing it with the SimCLR framework, whereas you're able to get 256 batch sizes in MoCo V2 compared to 4096, making it much more accessible depending on what kind of machine you're using. Because you know, in order to do 4096, you need to have you know, a really strong computation setup compared to uh, using the MoCo framework with 256 uh, you know, images in the batch sizes. An interesting idea presented in the momentum contrast of learning framework is this idea of training with dynamic targets instead of fixed targets. So usually in supervised learning or most self-supervised learning tasks, you're trying to match these labels that are constant throughout the training. So say the 0, 1, 0, 0 class label vector is not changing over time of the training, as in the you know, queries and keys are evolving together throughout the training of these representations. It's also interesting to think about the meta pseudo labels paper that's also looking at a way to dynamically adjust the targets as the neural network is training. So it might be another interesting kind of way of thinking about regularization and avoiding overfitting to think of ways to have these dynamically moving targets that might help the neural networks get out of these uh, local optima. Thanks for watching this explanation of momentum contrast of learning. Hopefully from this video, you're able to take away the difference between how the momentum encoder encodes the keys compared to an end-to-end -end gradient that goes back through the key encoder as well. Also making this problem where you have to keep the high dimensional images and then pass them through the key encoder and requiring much more memory to do this end-to-end -end kind of framework. Hopefully you also saw how the momentum encoder uses this uh, framework of updating the key parameters to avoid having these inconsistent keys that would be produced by something like a memory bank. Also, the queue helps you get these more consistent, updated keys as well. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.